All right, let's go ahead and roll into the content. I'm sure we're going to have a few more people trickle in. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining. Really excited about our topic today. Just to kick it off, um, again, we uh, our, our tagline for this webinar right here is don't let your quota take a summer vacation. Uh, we're going to talk about how we use spiffs to, to move the sale, to move, uh, to motivate sales and drive revenue. So um, no pun intended there. I, I'm going to try to use things like short-term incentive. I'm not going to continue to hit our brand name. This isn't meant to be a sales seminar on SPIS. We, we legitimately want, we have some people who are passionate and are great at talking about how to use short-term incentives, spots, bonuses, SPIFs, et cetera, to, to motivate and drive revenue. And I want to talk real quick about this, this fact of like, don't let your quota take a summer vacation. But before we do that, let's just kind of kick off like a few, uh, few housekeeping things here first. So um, first things first, everyone here, this will be recorded. If you're coming in late, it'll be recorded. Everything's there. It'll all be sent to you after. Everyone will be muted upon entry. This is a webinar format, but please use the, the Q&A in the chat. We have people who are helping us man this. We want this to be an open, really organic session where you have a chance to, to ask questions. We have some amazing experts on this call today with us who are gonna offer some great insights. So please take advantage of that. Um, we're really excited about diving in and I'm learning more about how we can use these different types of incentives to drive performance. And to, again, to, uh, to kind of backtrack just a second here, right? Where we come, where we're coming from with this, don't let your, uh, we'll go back to your page. Don't let your, sorry, my, my screen's being a little slow here. Don't let your, uh, your quota take a summer vacation. What we're coming with that is like historically Q3 and, and sometimes even early Q4 can be tough sales times, right? I know everyone's on a little bit of a different calendar, but you, you're past SKO, like, like six or seven months now. You, you've had your comp plans rolled out. Um, people during the summer are on summer vacation. You might be on summer vacation, literally, not just your quota. Um, and as a management team, as an individual contributor, whoever you are, it can be very easy for Q3 to be kind of slow. And one thing that we found and, and something that we find really effective is like, how can you utilize budget incentives, monetary, non-monetary, um, et cetera, to help motivate your team to make Q3 a success. So um, with that said, let's go ahead and dive into some intros. So Real quick, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Tanner Lacey. I'm one of the co-founders here at SPIV, and I currently run our, our work closely with our, our sales and marketing teams on our go-to-market strategy. Um, been at SPIV for about four years. And to kick this off, um, like one thing, I'm going to make this super cheesy. We're, we're back in the first day of school for all of our uh, panelists here. Um, just one quick random thing about you. The first thing I'll say is I'm just going to own it um, for myself. I have a nasty sunburn on my face. I went fishing on Saturday um, and it looks like I have circles around my eyes. You can see my hat tan line right here. I tried, um, didn't catch any fish. I was out in, the, out in the water for eight hours, but I had a good time. So really excited to be here with you guys today. I'll turn it to, let's just go in order on this, this um, panel here on this, on this slide. So we'll kick it to Ralph, Colin to Nick. Again, just who you are, where you're at, how long you've been there and then something, something to spice it up a little bit. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tanner. Hey, hey everybody. Ralph Grimsey here, partner with the Brevik Group. Uh, we're a sales enablement, sales consulting firm. I specialize in sales compensation as well as enablement programming. Uh, looking forward to today's conversation, you know, and, and really diving into the topic and become a fun fact. I am, you know, a, a passionate, this is maybe a little surprising, maybe a little dating myself, but I am a passionate Guns N' Roses fan. I'm actually in my office right now where I have uh, signed autographs of, of Axl Rose and Slash uh, surrounding these today. So I'm hoping we're going to bring that same level sort of rock star enthusiasm to this conversation. Awesome. Thanks, Ralph. That's, uh, I didn't know that. Um, so that's, that's good to know. I do. <laughs> no, we do. We're going to call him next. Sorry, I had you on mute. Uh, hi, everybody. Colin Cadmus. Uh, fun fact about me. All right. This is probably a little embarrassing, but I moved to the Jersey Shore uh, about nine months ago, and my feet haven't touched the sand yet. And I literally live on the beach, but uh, that's how much I've been working. I don't know if I should be proud of how much time you've been spending and working, or I'm not proud of it. I'm concerned. not proud of it. You put me on the spot, and I had to think of something fast, and uh, <laughs> that's what came to mind. <laughs> how badly I need to actually go out there and uh, enjoy the beach before the summer's <laughs> over. It flew by. 
Yeah, no kidding. Perfect. Per thanks, Colin. And Nick, we'll, uh, last but not least, we'll kick it over to you. All right. Thanks for having me. Uh, Nick Feeney here. I head up our commercial sales team at Mural. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we're a, a digital workspace company focused on hybrid collaboration. Uh, live in San Francisco, born and raised. I think, God, fun fact. Uh, I don't even know if you know this, Tanner, but two of your managers, Meredith Chandler and Angela Donato, were two of my top reps in a past life. So a little incestuous here. <laughs> That's awesome. I knew I knew about Ange. I didn't know about Meredith, so I'll have to go uh, go razz her later about that. But that's <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone. Thanks for for uh, bearing with us there on uh, bearing with me as I put you on the spot for kind of a, a quick intro there. Um, but let's go ahead and dive in again. We're gonna we have a prompt here. We have questions we're gonna ask. We're prepared, I promise. But we do want this to be organic. If you have questions, something that goes off of this, we don't need to stick to the script. In fact, I don't think we really want to. Um, we want this to be effective and useful for you. So I'm going to go ahead and kick actually kick off the screen share so we can have the panelists up here. Um, get, uh, we want, again, want this to be pretty organic, but I'm just going to kick it off. So, so Ralph, um, one of the biggest things, like I know me and you talked about this beforehand, right, is like the fact of like, when's, like how do you measure? Like one of the first things about this is like spiffs, these things, the Smith spot bonuses, et cetera, are really powerful, but sometimes the execution on them can be tough. Um, as you're working with clients, if you, as you've done this in the past, I know you guys are more generally on a, um, a larger scale doing bigger comp plans when you're consulting, but like, what's the right way to think about how, like, what's, what constitutes a good SPIF that's measurable and actionable? Yeah, let, let's actually, I'd like to actually kind of take it from the planning process, because I think in order to get to a good SPIF, it, tar it starts with sort of understanding that you have SPIFs in your arsenal and being clear as an organization that this is an effective tool to motivate the teams. And it starts with budgeting. A lot of the times, you know, we have clients that aren't clear in terms of just establishing a budget and a process to fund SPIF programs. Managers may come up with a great idea. They may want to ask for it, but then it's this challenge of where does the money come from and then ultimately get into the effectiveness and measurement. So as sort of rule number one, as we sort of think about this, is starting to say, listen, it is get real about it, plan for it, and budget for it. We're finding that organizations are budgeting about 1% of their total incentive budget for SPIF programs. So that starts the foundation. If you're starting to think about the financial side of this and the measurement side of it, let's first start talking about what is the pool of money we have to work with. And if you take 1% to 2% of your incentive budget, then you can start to look at what might be an effective SPIF and how you measure against it. Do you feel like that one to two, like that, that's really interesting, the data on the 1%. Do you feel like that's adequate to be able to run it? Is it, is it under allocated, over allocated? Like what's your, your thoughts on that? It really depends, right? It depends on sort of the size and scale of your team and what you're trying to do, right? Again, the SPIF programs are not trying to replicate your core incentive plan, right? This is something that is short-term in nature. It's supplemental. So we're not trying to, to blow out the budget here, but we do need to put some guidelines around, you know, the, the financial aspect of how much money you can dedicate to these kind of programs. So for us, it's a rough benchmark. You, you know, your mileage might differ, right? As you sort of look at your sales team and, and the size and scope of it. Perfect. No, that's, that's really, thank you for, for sharing that. It's like that number to me really, um, like it's, I think that's something I know I could do better as actually setting aside. We tend to like have to go ask and fight for budget on these as we as I come up with them. So it's that's a really a really good takeaway at least for me there. Um, and, and like kind of building off of that, like we are talking about the planning. <laughs> spiffs are funny, right? Because or, or short term, I'm not gonna try to use spiffs too much. Again, this isn't a branding exercise for for spiff. Um, but like as, as far as when you do these, like. They tend to, for me, like I oftentimes feel like I'm behind, like by the time I'm thinking about the SPIF, it's because the behavior is not there. Um, Colin, curious, you've ran sales teams, you've been in sales for a long time, like kind of building off of what Ralph says, how can you, like, we're talking about planning financially, how can you plan like strategically um, on those different things? Yeah, great question. So I like to start by just asking what you're trying to accomplish, because I actually think there's two different ways to approach SPIFs, or really two different reasons to approach them, right? One would be to incentivize a behavior, and that's what you see most often is, you know, you want to uh, drive a faster sale, or you want to get people to push for more enterprise deals, or you want them to... 
um, I don't know, qualify at a different rate, right? You're trying to move the needle somewhere in your funnel. And so to me, that's a spiff that's designed to drive a behavior. And that's the most common one. And there's another one, and they could be a, it could be a bit of a hybrid of both, which is um, to influence an emotion. And that's more along the, we want to pump up the team. We want to create some excitement. We want to uh, drive some energy and make it a little bit more fun this month or this quarter, right? And so I think it's important to first decide what are we trying to do? Are we trying to drive a behavior or uh, incentivize a behavior rather, or influence an emotion or a little bit of both, right? The emotion ones, I tend to say, I tend to just kind of let some people on the team put those things together, you know, come up with something fun, this and that here and there. Uh, but the incentivize a behavior one is, is really the one that I think can move the needle for, for sales leadership and for the rest of the team. And that's where, when you talk about budget, I actually think that this should be something that's making the company money, not something that's actually costing the company money. Um, and it takes a little bit of time to prove that, right? But if you're incentivizing the right behavior, even if you're spending a little bit of money to, to do it, uh, it should ultimately be something that's net positive for the business. And that's really the point of doing it. Um, at least that's the way that I've always looked at it, right? I could throw out an example. <clears throat> we had... Um, in one of my past companies, we had a, a very common problem, and you've probably all dealt with this at some point, or you're dealing with it now, uh, holding deals back at the end of the month for various reasons, right? People call it sandbagging or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and this tends to happen with your top performing reps, right? They, they have achieved their quota. Perhaps they've already surpassed it. And uh, maybe there's five, 10 days left in the month, and they've made a decision for whatever reason that it's better for them to hang on to some of those deals uh, to have a head start going into next month. And so that's a tough situation, right? Because there you're saying, wow, you know, I've got great reps. I don't want to necessarily mess with anything they're doing because they're doing a great job. But I know that they maybe have some sort of incentive to hang on to some of these deals because they're thinking about how their accelerators work and where it will max out, you know, their earning potential a bit more long term. And so that's where I think you can actually start to put a spiff or something in place to start to solve for that problem. And so I've done things in the past, and this may not be your traditional way of thinking of a spiff. A lot of people think of it more as just a, a fun contest, but I've always sort of challenged that. And I said, well, if we're not really getting anything out of it, then what, why are we doing it? Right. Cause the, the fun emotional type stuff doesn't need to cost money, right? That could just be bragging rights. It could be weird prizes, little things that people get that don't actually cost the business a ton of money. Uh, and I've had tons of success with that stuff as well. But when you think about driving those behaviors, you should be spending money that's actually going to earn the company money. And so in that particular example, what I did is I put a spot bonus in place and I went to my finance team. I said, hey, I have a million reasons to suspect this is what's happening. I can't exactly prove it to you right now. But if you'll give me this much money to play with next month, I'm pretty sure I can prove to you that we can spend that money and actually make more money. And so I played around with the amounts and, and figured out what would actually drive those reps to say, I don't want to hold on to those deals anymore. I actually want to get uh, all, every last deal in. And so I put something in place. I started measuring sort of the timing of how that was all happening, you know, analyzing some pipelines. And long story short, I put something in place where they got a cash spot bonus for anyone who hit their quota by the 20th of the month. And now this was in place specifically to drive the behavior on those particular reps, right? I knew this wasn't going to affect everyone on the team. And that was fine. I was trying to solve a very specific problem. And once I got the cash bonus, right, it got to a point where those people wanted to hit that every single month, because they realized if they earn that cash bonus every month, their OTE for the year goes up significantly, right? In other words, it's $500 a month, you get a 6k increase or something like that. But now what you're doing is you're massively accelerating your pipeline for your top reps, and everyone else follows suit, right? So the top rep who used to be at 100% to goals now at 140, everyone else pushing that much harder too. And it didn't take long to, to prove that that extra spend was worth it. And what started out as a spiff turned into just a regular component of our, of our comp plan. And so that's how I view a very successful spiff is that it should become a regular component of your comp plan, unless of course you're solving for a temporary problem or, or trying to drum up that, uh, that emotional side of, of the energy you could say. But uh, yeah, I guess that's a high level scope of how I have viewed these in the past. Yeah, that's, I love the uh, concept of like, spiffs are almost like an experimental adjustment to your comp plan where it's like, yes. if you're thinking about long-term strategy, because I don't know that I think about it like that, right? Like a lot of the times I'm thinking about like, hey, um, we need to sell more of X or I need people to be more motivated for this amount of time. So like, and give I think me a that's budget the problem right it. there. I, I yep. think that's the problem. If you're trying to solve a problem, uh, it's not to say it can't work here or there, right? But I, I don't think there's much sense 
in band-aiding problems, right? If you have a problem with motivation or you have a problem with any of these things, coming up with a one-time solution this month really doesn't help you that much. It does right now, but what does it do long-term? Um, Cause what's going to happen when that contest isn't there next month, right? It, like it just, you go back to worse because now it's actually not there. So, so that's the way I've always looked at these things. If they're working, you should keep doing them. And, and that should be the way you approach it. Now that's why I separate the two because we've, I've done plenty of, I use another example for my, but I call it influencing emotion, which is really like, Hey, we just want to drum up some energy in this office, right? Things have maybe been a little bit down or, or, or whatever. Um, and I started, the, I can't even say I started this. This happened uh, when I was on the phones at, at Single Platform. They did something called Color Wars. And Color Wars was a concept where we had about 100 reps throughout the company, all on teams of about 10, 10 reps roughly on each team. So the company grew really fast and we started to realize people were kind of clicking off into silos and, and not everyone really knew each other and hiring groups were becoming best friends, but the company was kind of living in these pods. And so uh, even though we had mixed up a lot of the teams, we said, we really want to get more people involved with each other. So we started something called Color Wars and we would do it every year. It turned into an annual tradition. People would actually look forward to being a part of it. So if someone was like thinking about quitting and Color Wars was about to start for the year, it was almost like a retention thing, like President's Club. Um, but the idea was you take people from all these different teams and mix them onto their own teams. So you have the red team, the blue team, the white team, whatever. Uh, and they would come up with, uh, for they have a lot of different things they'd have to do. First, we'd have them design a big marketing board for their team that was their brand as a team. Now, none of this stuff is really driving sales, right? This was all to, to team bond, uh, team building, team bonding, all that type of stuff. Every day they'd come in and we'd do an update because you'd earn points through different activities on the team. So even though these folks were on different sales teams, all of their points were accumulating together to bring them together as the blue team or, or whatever. And so that type of stuff drove a ton of energy, but I also think it's very specific to the sales culture. Like it happened to work for that team. Some teams may think that's really stupid and childish. Um, so I think you need to match it with the culture uh, properly as well. Totally, and I, I think like uh, something that you kind of said in between the lines there too, that is definitely worth calling out is attrition's expensive, right? And so if like, especially in a downtime, a, a change, like you may not be increasing revenue with some of those. Although like, I think you could argue that generally happier reps, people who are more, more oh, happier are going to perform 33%, better. They're 33% more productive in sales when you're happy. Yeah, totally. And I think as well as like, depending on the cost of your reps, like it takes 12 months ish to ramp a rep. It costs thousands and that like tens of thousands of dollars to ramp a rep. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at it from a bottom line perspective, I think that's also a really powerful argument there to, to fight for budget. Um, and like one thing that we're, as we're talking about this, right, we, we have some good, good ideas around like how we prep, how we plan, why we do it. But um, Nick, as I think you probably know like pretty well, um, a lot of times like leadership, whoever, like maybe even the CEO will come up with these things, but then it's left to, to the managers of these teams to actually like run them, right? Like you're, you're the ones who actually have to go through and like make sure your team knows about it, make sure they're running, make sure you're following up and making it consistent to be, uh, to be successful. I'm curious on that, what, what you found is like, best strategy as far as taking what we're talking about here and actually like action, like making it actionable and successful on your team? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, you know, I've, I've worked with some leaders earlier in my career that just said, Hey, here's some money, go figure it out. Right. Like tr try and solve through a spiff. And to Colin's point, you know, you, you can't just put a bandaid over maybe a bigger problem, which might be an unattainable quota. So I think before you even get to the execution, you got to figure out how do we ideate? How do we seek to understand, right? How are the reps being motivated, which we talked about? I think cash is always the most intrinsic part of, of any kind of spiff, but that might not always be the answer. You know, do you do an experience? Do, do you split the team into two, which, which I always like to do, or three or four, depending on your, your structure and make it, you know, competitive and collaborative and, and add a little gamification to it. But you got to figure out how are we driving the right behavior? Um, and I think one of the, the biggest problem is how you implement it or how you find the time to implement it. And it's not during a time where you're not exceeding quota, right? I think the best time to implement it is when you're absolutely crushing and exceeding because we want to reward the right behavior. I don't think we want to endorse poor behavior. And I think that's what we, we typically find. I think earlier in my career too, I would figure out maybe if a spiff is going to help drive that right behavior towards more ARR or close more business when in all actuality, maybe you just don't have the right comp plan in place, or maybe we're not supporting the team in the right way, or we're not educating them or the ramp is off. 
So I, I do think it all starts to a point of ideation and seeking to understand before you can really execute. And I think the other part is, you know, in terms of selfishness, you know, when you look at uh, any leader out there who's listening, are you doing a spiff that's going to drive more ARR? That's what we measured on, right? You know, for me, we have we have two different ways that we're measuring. It's ARR and also the, the quantity or the number of lands that we close. Am I focusing on getting the highest ARR deals to correlate with a spiff? Or am I saying, hey, let's figure out if we can book more opportunities for those that are measured more on lands to create more pipeline, right? So how do you drive the behavior where it, it is selfish for yourself and the business, but also for the reps to close more business? So that, that is another way of executing to make sure that you're not putting a spiff towards something that isn't going to drive any behavior upward towards quota attainment. I love, yeah, I love that. Like the, the focus aspect of spiffs is like often lost, right? Through execution. I, I totally agree. Um, and like you brought up something in there that was really interesting. You talked about intrinsic, extrinsic. You talked about the different types of things you're doing. I, this is something that I think is, um, pretty prevalent today because uh it's we're, we're trying to figure out how to make these most effective um kind of, i'm actually just going to toss this to the group or and nick you were just talking about us so maybe you have some thoughts but do you i guess the question i'll just, I'll just make it pretty straightforward monetary versus non-monetary what's what's better what works when um what are your guys' thoughts when it comes to these spot bonuses spiffs etc around uh, how you're actually rewarding them let me jump in it's yeah, yeah, jump in, Colin. I'll, I'll follow How's you. my volume, by the way, Chris? Chris jumped in the comments, said I was a little bit low. Can you hear me good? Everyone hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Monetary versus non-monetary. If it's still a little low, Chris, I think your volume might be a little bit low. Really? I'm blowing my ears out over here. <laughs> How about now? Is that better or worse? Now? Better? 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 There you, you go, good? Colin. I think that's a little better. Okay. All right. Monetary versus non-monetary. So I, I think for me, again, it goes back to those two choices. Are you trying to incentivize a behavior or an emotion for the behaviors monetary, right? Cash is King. It's why people are in sales. Um, for the emotions, you can go with the non-monetary stuff. You can have a team night out that everyone's jealous. They didn't get to go to, or some trophy that floats around the office that everybody wants to have that type of stuff, uh, I think works well for, for the emotional type things, but a lot of it comes down. I think someone asked a question a little bit earlier about just execution, right? And, and making this work. It's all about the buy-in from the right people on the team. Uh, if you get those key players excited about it, then the rest kind of follow suit. And so I like to involve those people who have influence on the team, the people who really are kind of the leaders of the of the ship out there and, and get them involved in designing this stuff. Because if they like it and they're into it, the rest of the team will follow, will follow into that. Ralph, I saw you churning on something there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think it comes back, this not monetary, non-monetary, I think comes back a little bit to the objectives, right? And I think the harder edge your objective is, it kind of leans more towards a monetary sort of type of reward. There's a couple of things that we haven't necessarily talked about in terms of the focus areas for SPIFs that I think are important. A lot of the things that we see is, and I, it goes back to Colin's point around experimentation, right? As you look at your incentive plan, a lot of plans that we see out there are based specifically just on a, a general revenue number, a general activity number Did you, from an SDR perspective, right? SPIS can kind of give us some of that specificity. And I'm thinking about two in particular, customer types, trying to penetrate and attack particular verticals, and then additional product or use cases. Can you sort of use SPIFs to sort of really encourage broader rep participation in the full suite of offerings that you have, right? A lot of reps, they can make their numbers, you know, hitting your, your bread and butter product, your core product, but are they selling ancillary services? Are they selling PS? Are they selling, are they working with the right partners? Uh, are they selling additional, you know, modules within, within your solution? So I think a lot of times those eventually get into incentive plans as you, as you scale and as you get to more maturity, SPIFs are a great place to start that on a quarterly basis, starting to look at, at, at some more focused areas for reps to, to penetrate. I, I fully agree, Ralph and Colin. I think the only part that uh, I would add is um, I always start with budget because you never know what you're going to get when it comes to SPIFs. I like to survey my team because some folks are more monetary focused, right? They do want cash. As you said, Colin, cash is king. Um, but sometimes I'll group 
people together. You know, we've got a team of 20 sellers. So some are more focused on cash, some want more non-monetary uh, spiffs. And then we measure it afterwards. Is it driving that behavior? And I think it is nice for a seller to say, hey, I'm going to raise my hand. This is the type of spiff that I want that we already know is budgeted versus someone else who maybe might not be measured that way. So I think it is more individualistic to go and find something that's going to drive that behavior for that person or that team. Um, so it's not so fixed. Yeah, I, I love that. And I think like um, personal opinion here, I think if you can find a way to scale personal incentives and spiffs, they're more effective. The problem with that question is scale, right? Like it's it's really hard depending on how your team setup is. Um, I recently at Spiff, we stood up and, and kind of got a sales engineering team started. And in Q4, we had a spiff just to push. Um, and what we did was actually really effective, but it took a lot of time. And what we did is I had everyone, I gave them the budget. I said, hey, for everyone who hits their goal, you're going to get X amount of money towards an experience. Like I'm not writing you a check. I'm not giving you a dollar. You have $1,500 and I'm buying you something or I'm sending you somewhere. That's your budget. Um, and I had all of them send that over and it was really effective. We had almost everyone hit it. We had a knockout of the park, record-breaking Q4. Um, but like it's it's hard because some people do just want cash and, and like, I, it's, it's, it's hard. I, I also would say like, um, and I feel like I can say this because I'm a millennial and so I can just bash on my own, on my own, uh, generation here. But like, I like the, the option to where it's like, if I get the money, it's going to get spent on groceries or my, if my kids are going to break something. I have to buy something new with whatever, um, with, with the money that we spent, but where, where, if someone is forcing you to do something, you're going to do something that you wouldn't have done otherwise. Um, we had one person who wanted a new e-bike and so we bought them a new e-bike with that, with that cash, right? Like that's, that's a, a cool thing that they can, they can do, but scale is the, the tough part. And, and this is uh, like, I, I see we have a question here in the Q and A and I actually kind of want to transition to this here. I know Ralph, I can see your, your typing answer. I don't want to, I don't want to stop you there. You can finish typing. Um, but this was actually really interesting. Like we're talking a lot about like how to increase performance, how to make it better, but are spiffs only for underperformance? Like are spiffs only effective for people who are underperforming? Are they more effective for people who are already performing? Like, um, Ralph, I mean, I, I think I'll let you finish typing this answer. We'd love to get your feedback on this as you're, as you're, I don't know if I can do both. So if I yeah, can talk right. at the same time. But I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 no, I thought you I could do goes, both, but it's good. I think it goes back to the, back to the points, right? I mean, I think if, if folks are hitting their quotas, I would, I would still think about spiffs as, as a strategic lever that you can pull. You have a robust business. As you sort of think about all the things we've talked about so far, from sales cycle length, pipeline velocity, you know, you know speed to deal. I mean, we're, we're, I'm assuming, Dave, you're, you're in a SaaS business here, is that the quicker you get those deals done, the quicker you can realize that revenue, right? It's not just from, from the seller's perspective, it's about you know, contract value and ACC, but for the business perspective, it's ARR, right? So you want to get that revenue in as quickly as possible. So just because they're hitting their quota, there's lots of other factors that, that I think are ripe for, for SPIFs. Nick, anything you'd add on that? No, I agree. I mean, I, I kind of touched on it earlier, but I, I think if you only provide spiffs during poor performance, we're rewarding for that. And I think it's putting a bandaid over a bigger problem. So I, I fully agree that when people are succeeding, that we should figure out what are the areas in the business that we maybe need to drive the right behavior toward. Because look, quotas are always ever changing. And I think there, there are other ways to drive spiffs that maybe are more non-monetary um, when the team is hitting that we can continue to put the, the kind of gas toward, right? I, I agree 100%. And Colin, you kind of touched on this earlier, but how do you go from the mindset? I would say that it's natural to try to use spiffs to boost underperformance versus accelerate overperformance. Like how, how do you change that mindset? you need to just kind of stop yourself in your tracks and realize that what you're doing is, is a short-term benefit, right? And, and if you have a long-term problem, you have to be thinking long-term. So when you're looking at a, a, a slow pipeline or, or, or some sort of problem in your process, if you're just thinking about fixing it this month, that's, that's the way your sales manager should be thinking, right? And, and give them a budget to figure that type of stuff out. But as a VP or a director or someone who's, who's thinking about the long-term effect on the business, you can observe some of those things that they do, but you should be thinking about how to impact long-term change, right? And so leave that, like I said, leave that smaller stuff to the managers, give them a little budget, let them play around with those things. But if you see that they keep having to come up with contests, you know, to solve for, for this little issue, then you obviously have a larger issue uh, to, to focus on. And how do you train yourself to do that? I mean, for me, it's just, 
it's years of making that mistake, right? It's years of putting effort into fix something for a month or a quarter, and then just to have it go right back to how it was. Um, one other thing I'll throw in there too, uh, that's worth thinking about um, when to use spiffs. I, I love using it when we're rolling out some sort of a new initiative, right? And you're trying to get people to take on a new habit or a new new part of uh, their process. Let's say we have rolled out a whole training on how to ask for referrals, right? You wanna put a spiff in place right as you're rolling that out to, to really drive that and make, make everyone hit the ground running. So that's another really good time to use it because you're rolling out a long-term change, but you can use the temporary spiff to make sure it, it, it hits the ground running and people take it seriously. So that's another way to, to use it in the long-term. Awesome, I, I really like that. I think some of these points kind of speak, there's a question in the chat around this, you know, it looks like maybe an SDR trying to get to meetings booked. And I think a lot of what we're talking about sort of covers that point. I, I don't, I'd be curious of, of Nick and Colin, your perspective on that question that's in there. But I think well, my perspective is, I don't know if that's an ideal use of spit, of a way to sort of encourage, you've got a market condition in which, you know, Mondays are slow and you're trying to motivate your team you know, I, I'm, that one's borderline for me. I, I think this one might be an example of something that there's, there's more, you know, a systemic issue there around both pickup rates on Monday that I, I don't know what a spiff is going to specifically solve there, but I, yeah, I love the problem worse to your point, yeah. right? If Mondays are slow for, for whatever reason in that market, you might actually make the problems worse. Um, you know, we had a similar issue at one of my companies where summers were really, really slow and try put you know, something brings up, why don't we put extra incentives in place? I said, why don't we encourage people to take their vacations that month? Yeah, right. right. Maybe that's a better solution. And, and sometimes things aren't meant to be solved. They're, they're meant to be worked around. So I think it, it's a great point that you really want to notice the difference between those two. Yeah. But, yeah, but a spiff could be a good way to figure it out. Absolutely. I think the other part, the I, I made this mistake in my career is uh, allowing the reps to come to you and say, let's do a spiff to drive this behavior. You know, if you don't set a calendar around your spiffs, I think your reps can get greedy, right? So especially during the summertime when things are maybe a little bit lower, do you want to set the precedent that you're not doing spiffs during that time? Or maybe you do, you know, you pick which way you're going to lean on. But I think having a calendar year or a quarterly cadence of, of when you're going to do a spiff so they know up front makes it easier to have a little bit more control over when you're going to reward the team. That's a great point. Yeah, because if you get down into that, like, into that that water where like every time things are tough they just expect a spiff or they expect something special it's going to be extra hard this month that's why i try to just really avoid looking at it that way because it can very much turn into that pretty quickly mm -hmm. i love this and um this uh, this is one thing that i've loved about our conversation so far is there's been a ton of actionable insights right like i've taken around like what are some looks at like how you can budget this how do you look about it how do you plan these out i, I think one thing that i'd love to uh, Nick, I'll kick this to you first to get your insight on is how long should these last, right? Like how, what's a good time frame for one to fit in? I know we're talking about some that are continual, but like, I'm curious on your take on like, what's, what's the sweet spot to make sure they don't lose their luster. You know, I don't think there's a right answer for that. You got to test it out. Um, I've had some spiffs that are too long and I think it's all dependent on the team and how they're measured. You know, are they on a monthly quota? Is it quarterly? Is it annual? You want to make sure for specific spiffs that I think that, that are monetary, it, it should be around how they're measured. My team's on a monthly number. So when I look at it, it's tough. Do I want to do 12 spiffs a year? Probably not. Do I want to look at it at a quarterly basis? Potentially, but I, I try to look at what the problem is first. What are we trying to solve for? And I think that will help you understand what the timeline should be. Awesome. Thank you. Any other insight, Colin, Ralph, on like, on a, I totally agree with you on that, on that, Nick. Like there's, it's, it's hard to like slice and dice this and even into different camps. Like it's, it's such a, a personal and unique situation, but curious on other insights there on timing. I think my I preference would be exactly with what he said. Yeah, monthly or quarterly too. I think beyond that, it gets really hard. Then, then you're starting to replicate the, the incentive plan too much. I yeah, think. then it's just permanent at that point, yeah. right? If it's longer than quarterly. Yeah. I think that the tough part too that I struggle with sometimes is when you have new reps that are joining and they're ramping, you know, are they a part of that spiff? Do they get a spiff? Um, how do you incentivize the right behavior for them, depending on if you're paying them out in full within their first grant period. But that's always tough because there's that sense of like, I don't feel like I'm able to attain something or I'm not a part of this team. So I'd be curious for you guys how you handle that or how you have handled that. With the color wars example, you had to earn your way into it. So actually new right. hires were not allowed in. Now this was 
This was circa 2012 when, when this came out. There, there was a little bit of earning your stripes culture at this place. You had to close your first sale before you got your first piece of swag. Uh, it, it had a lot of that rooted in, in the culture, which was you know really just like kind of earning your way up the, the social ranks sort of, but everyone loved it and was bought into it. So it was fun. Um, whereas if they weren't, that could also be bad perhaps for the wrong group of people. But uh, yeah, in that situation, it was something that people wanted to be a part of. Similar, very similar to President's Club uh, type of uh, mentality around that. Yeah, I think that's like the age old question, right? Of like, <laughs> where do you draw the line on President's Club? Right, like, like we're, we're actually going through that conversation right now or we're growing it so quickly. It's like, when do you, when do you decide when like, you're, you've ramped too long to be eligible for, or, or that you're you're in ramping uh, too close, I guess, the president's club to make it make it fair, right? So um, I think for president's club, it's pretty simple. You put a dollar amount, right? And whoever hits that dollar amount of revenue for the year goes, I don't care how long you've been here, you hit that amount, you're in, right? You take the yeah. annual quarter, whatever that amount is, and who cares how long you've been here? I'd love to see Perfect. a new hire get in there, right? Who hasn't been there for a full year. I mean, that's that's going to push the rest of the team. I think that's a good thing. That's all. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, hey, guys, we're, we're here pretty tight on time. I want to be respectful to that, especially all your time here. We have one last Q&A, and then I want to I want to flip it over to just kind of like last words um, from each of you. So real quick, um, and Ralph, maybe I'll, I'll kick this to you. When you're, when you're talking with your clients, when you're using monetary SPIFs um, or you're talking about a SPIF budget, is there a certain dollar amount or percentage of incentive comp that you're usually telling them to target to make it effective? Yeah, I mean, typically we, we don't like to see it north of 5% of total cash. That's kind of our rule of thumb because if you start to skew, if it starts to get greater than that, you got to really question whether or not um, it should be part of the, the general incentive plan. So you want to make it meaningful. We often sort of talk about it on a post-tax basis. So if you're looking at an individual, you're looking at a dollar number, Back to, you know, are you going to spend it on groceries? Are you going to spend it on your, your cell phone bill? Think about it on a post-tax basis. It's got to be meaningful enough that they can do something with it uh, after taxes. That's that's sort of our, so overall 5% total cash, but also look at it on a post-tax basis. Yeah, I can throw in one thing that we've done in the past. We're using gift cards. Um, turned into a bit of an accounting problem at a certain point because we were yeah. buying so many of them. Like, $10,000 worth of stacks of, of $100 or $50 gift cards. Uh, turns out that that is non-taxable income. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. So very small scale, maybe you can do a little bit of that. If your company's really small, you've got four or five reps on the team. But with 100 reps, uh, we did that a little bit too long, got in a little bit of trouble with our CFO. But uh, nonetheless, the reps loved it for the point that you just mentioned. It's tax-free. They walk out of there with that 100 bucks. They're buying dinner right now. Yeah, I love that. I've, I've also had my hand slapped on that. So I'll suck at that. I'll suck at that one. Yeah. Um, but well, everyone, thanks so much again there for all these ways around this that with gifts, though. Like perhaps if you're actually buying them, you know, maybe you're saying we're going to give you $100 towards Amazon. You actually buy them something on Amazon. I don't know how all that works, but I know the gift card particularly was was a, was an issue. Yeah, if it was Ralph's, cash, if it was Ralph's got some. Uh, I can see the scar I'm tissue just there. Yeah. There's scar tissues there. And then there's a lot of organizations. You guys have seen those point programs. There's lots of great things that are out, uh, you know, options out there. You can sort of earn points and then, and then get yeah. all within the law. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we want to stay within the law. I love it. Um, so everyone, well, let's, let's go just kind of last words here. 30 seconds. Um, let's kind of go backwards from how we started introduction. So let's go to Nick, Colin, Ralph, um, and then we'll, we'll close this off. Get everyone back to the day. Yeah, I mean, hey, this is great. I think the conversations around SPIFs are, are so pertinent right now, especially while the majority of people are working from home. I think just to, to summarize, if anyone's going to take any of my commentary away, it's before you execute, like ideate, make sure you do some discovery with your team and seek to understand that that's so crucial. Like just how we teach our sellers to do discovery, do it with your team and figure out how are they incentivized? What's going to drive the right behavior? And make sure that you put a cap or some kind of control as to how frequently or, or non-frequently you're going to be doing spiffs. Love it. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Colin, I'll kick it to you. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll leave off with, with two points. One is to start with understanding the objective, right? Are you trying to influence a behavior? Are you trying to uh, influence an emotion? The next is, and I don't think we really, maybe we touched on this a little bit, but I'll, I'll leave with it, which is be very aware of what the side effects of these type of incentives can be. 
uh, when you incentivize something, you could incentivize a wrong behavior, right? You could incentivize scheduling a lot of bad meetings. You could incentivize fudging metrics in, in many, many, many different ways. And so you have to be really careful about that uh, and really just keep an eye on, on it when you roll this stuff out. But think about that too, because if you put too much incentive behind something, somebody may have mentioned this, but at certain point, you're really just telling them to do whatever it takes to get it done. And that is not always a good thing, particularly in sales. Thanks, Colin. I told I mean, just behavioral 101, right? You got to be careful with that. So thank, thank you so much for that insight there. Ralph, last but not least. We'll yeah, echoing, I think, both Nick and, and Colin's feedback. I think we had a good discussion. I think thinking strategically about the use of SPIFs. I, I like this point around experimentation, right? I think it's an opportunity on a short-term basis to try things to fix particular problems. And I think as a summary, I think that's the overall message here. Uh, we've talked about all the ways to do it and sort of some of the, the as Colin just mentioned, the things to think about um, as you roll these things out. But I think that's the big message. Use it to experiment and use it to attack particular problems. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with that. I, I love that concept of experimentation with, with really any, I mean, in reason, any type of comp adjustment plan, et cetera. And um, I think that definitely rings true for, for SPIFs. And um, my, my last words here, I know this is a, uh, uh, I wasn't included as much in this conversation on purpose, but the one thing I would say that I've taken away from this is everything, like the success of any specific program is going to hinge on communication. So everything we're talking about, everything that we're working through, it takes communication on all fronts, communicating to your leaders, communicating to your team, consistently communicating. Um, I think that's just one thing that we often don't plan on when we're doing these SPIF programs is like, we talk a lot about the tactical about how it's gonna happen. We often leave out like, how often am I gonna to talk to my team about it? Am I bringing this up in one-on-ones? Is leadership talking about it, et cetera. Um, so that's that's maybe a key takeaway for me. Again, thank you so much, Nick, Colin, Ralph for joining us. I learned a ton. Um, in fact, you guys might see a couple of content articles come out of this. I'll make sure to quote my sources here. Um, Tanner, but thank you, want, you so I'll much. Throw in one last tip on what you just mentioned. Try to find Love an it. MC on your team who's going to MC the whole thing, who's going to do the communicating, who's going to be there for you. Like as a leader, unless you've got great management, who's, who's got the time for a VP, you're really not going to have the time to follow through, I think, on this as much as you probably want to. Uh, and I've definitely screwed up, right? You launch something, you roll it out, and all of a sudden you're dragged into meetings for a week straight and the thing loses steam. So I think it's good to find someone who's going to help you MC the whole thing and stay on top of it every day. Someone, yeah. ideally a rep, someone who's going to be really and, bought into it. And nothing is worse than when you get into a one-on-one, -on -one, like two months later, they're like, hey, I think you owe me dinner. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, um, so good, thanks, Colin. I appreciate it. Thanks for jumping in there. And, Again, thank you so much, everyone. We were at time here. Really appreciate everyone who's come, everyone who's listening to this after the fact. Again, this recording, recording will be available. We'll make it, uh, we'll send it out a few different ways. Uh, if you have any questions for any of the panelists here, find us on LinkedIn. Um, feel free to reach out with any additional questions, especially if there's more tactical questions. There's a lot of great insight that can come out of this group. Um, but thanks again for the time. Uh, as, as kind of a follow-up, we will be having another SPIF webinar here in the next couple of weeks. I believe it's the beginning of September with the Alexander Group. Um, so if you'd like to, to join that as well, just kind of keep a po follow SPIF's LinkedIn page to get information there. Um, thanks so much again to all our panelists for the time and everyone joining, and we'll see you guys later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.